Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Seizing Life, a bi-weekly podcast produced by Cure Epilepsy. Today, I'm excited to welcome Leanne Kupferberg Carter to the podcast. Leanne is a journalist whose articles and essays have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times Parenting Section, The Washington Post, The Chicago Tribune, The Huffington Post, and Parents. She is also the author of the memoir, Ketchup is My Favorite Vegetable, A Family Grows Up with Autism. Leanne's son, Mickey, was diagnosed with autism when he was five years old, and several years later received an additional diagnosis of epilepsy. Leanne is here today to talk about her family's journey with autism and epilepsy and the connection between these two often comorbid conditions. Leanne, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about this uh, incredibly uh, valuable topic. I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation for so many of our listeners. I want to start by finding out uh, how epilepsy first entered uh, your and Mickey's life. Well, we didn't see it early on with him, but he was already in early intervention for other issues, and around the time he was five, He was at his play therapist's office, and he just started to stare, um, became unresponsive, and then sort of slumped backwards and looked like he was passing out. Um, Skin went gray. We weren't sure he was breathing. It was was really terrifying. Um, We called 911. By the time they got there, he was breathing and beginning to come out of it, but we uh, got in the ambulance. We went to the emergency room where he, he dozed, and at that point, they didn't know what it was, uh, so they recommended we speak to a neurologist, which we did, and uh, he hospitalized us for 48 hours for a video EEG, and at that point, he said that he couldn't make a diagnosis of epilepsy, although um, from the activity he saw that perhaps Mickey was more prone to seizures, um, and then we didn't see anything again until he was seven, and something similar happened. Um Uh, We called the pediatrician, ran over to the doctor's office. By the time we got there, he was already coming out of it. And the doctor said, oh, I I think it was just syncope. You know, he he fainted. But this was not, this looked different than fainting. So we didn't really see anything until he reached adolescence at uh, around the age of 12. Again, he was working with a tutor at home one night. And she came in and said to me, you know, he's playing this funny game. He won't talk to me. And I just, and my heart sank. I just knew something was going on. I ran in there and I found him, eyes locked to the side, rigid, not moving. Um, called to my older son to run next door to get my neighbor, who happens not only to be a physician, but has a child with uh, seizures. And she came over, and even by the time she got there, he was still locked in that, that rigidity with the eyes to one side. And then he heaved this huge sigh, and it was like, like a puppet being let loose, you know, just suddenly the strings dropped and he collapsed. And then at that point he came back to himself. So again, reached out, found a different neurologist uh, at NYU. We hospitalized him for about a week for video EEG. And at that point we finally did get a diagnosis that he uh, had epilepsy in addition to autism. But looking back when he was little, I think we were seeing absence seizures. Um, at the time, he would, you know, just go blank for a few seconds and not answer if you called him. And when I brought that up to therapists, they would say, oh, that's, that's just autism. Um, but looking back now, I don't think it was. So give us a little background on Mickey's autism and how you came to that diagnosis as we sort of move into talking about this comorbidity. Well, I'll, I'll try to condense it and give you the Reader's Digest version because, they, <laughs> again... Did not get a, a diagnosis on that one until fairly late. I, as a mom, not and not a first time mom, knew something was amiss. By the time he was nine or ten months old, he wasn't um, hitting certain developmental milestones. Things like um, how big is the baby, or he, he didn't point. Um, he wasn't imitating, and but it was that seemed to be all it was at that point because he was he was engaged. He was funny, lovable, you know, he smiled a lot, Um, but something just felt amiss. It was a a qualitative thing rather than quantitative. 
And every month, you know, when we would have our monthly checkup at the pediatrician, I'd bring it up and he would uh, tell me, no, no, he's fine. He's still within normal parameters. Don't compare him to your older son. Boys talk later. But it wasn't until he was 18 months old and still not speaking. And I saw the doctor again for his 18 month checkup. And he said, okay, now maybe it's time to go for a speech evaluation. We did that. Yes, there was a speech delay. We started to address that. The nursery school suggested we explore a little further. We got a referral to a very well-known medical center here in New York. Um, we went for what they called a comprehensive interview. We went. He, they put him through all the paces, psychological, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, ran the gamut, exhausted him. And at the end of that, and that was, it was pretty brutal, the head of the team sat us down and said, don't expect higher education for your child. And it was like peering into the abyss. Uh, we didn't know what that meant. I mean, we, we brought this sparkly, happy, loving child in and then to be told something like that. Um, I should add, this was the early 90s. I think not a great deal was known about autism at that point. Um, and they did not diagnose him with autism. They just said communication disorder. Uh, then we found our way to an expert down in Bethesda, Stanley Greenspan, who was at the time the preeminent psychiatrist for treating these kinds of disorders. He spent four hours with us, uh, videotaped us playing, which was uh, a little uncomfortable, made me feel like we were flunking Play 101. And then at the end of that, he, he gave us several diagnoses, none of which were autism. He called it static encephalopathy, he, uh, multi-system developmental delay, um, but he did outline a very ambitious program of therapy and said, you don't know how high he's going to go until he reaches his ceiling, and that's true of any child, so don't compare him to your other child. And he, it was really, it was a wonderful visit because he kind of gave me back my hope, um, but again, no firm diagnosis, and it wasn't until Mickey had that seizure in the therapist's office when he was five. At that point, the neurologist uh, said that he had PDD, NOS, uh, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which is um, a form of autism. But that was really late in the game. Um, and again, I have to stress it was the 90s. Not as much was known. And I don't know that that would happen today. I think they'd be a lot quicker out of the gate to diagnose it. We know that one third of people with autism are at a much higher risk for developing seizures and epilepsy. When Mickey received his ASD diagnosis, was epilepsy mentioned to you as something that you should be on the lookout for? Never. No, nobody ever mentioned it to us, um, which is shocking looking back. I will say that again, it was the 90s and not as much was known about autism. Um, what, what most people knew at that point was the movie Rain Man, or there was a character on that TV show, St. Elsewhere, but, um, nobody knew people with autism, at least not in, in my extended circles. And I, I don't know, maybe they had not really correlated the, um, the prevalence at that point. That's the only reason I can think of because no, nobody ever, ever mentioned it to us. I wish they had. Do you know if that has changed? Is there any push within the autism community for there to be more discussion or more warning to parents to be on the lookout for seizures and epilepsy? That's a great question. I, I don't know if there is officially. Certainly, I see it because I, I get phone calls frequently from parents of much younger children who are diagnosed and um, looking, you know, looking for advice. And I am asked about that now. So I think there is a general awareness in the autism community about the prevalence, but as to whether the clinicians are really sitting the families down and saying, hey, look, this is what you have to be on the lookout for, I couldn't answer that. I hope so. I hope so too. Hi, this is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. An estimated 3.4 million Americans and 65 million people worldwide currently live with epilepsy. For more than 20 years, Cure Epilepsy has funded cutting-edge, patient-focused research. 
Learn what you can do to support epilepsy research by going to cureepilepsy.org. Now back to Seizing Life. So it's not until adolescence, he's 12 years old, when he officially gets that epilepsy diagnosis. What, what treatments did you try and did they work? Have you found a successful treatment? Ah, that, that's still a work in progress. We've found that medication is more of an art than a science. Uh, we started him on Lamictal. It seemed okay for a few weeks. Then it was actually, it was his 13th birthday. We went to the movies. We went to see Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. We were perhaps sitting maybe a little too close to the screen and there was a lot of flickering and a lot of color action going on. And just towards the last five minutes of the movie, suddenly he pulled to the side and had a tonic clonic uh, with me holding him. And it, it was horrifying. It was the first time I'd seen that. Um, lasted perhaps two minutes, although it felt like an eternity. Uh, and then when he came back to himself, one side of his face looked paralyzed. Um, he was talking out of the other side. And uh, we waited till that passed. Interestingly, nobody in the movie theater around us noticed or looked, which, you know, I felt like my life had been splayed open and nobody noticed. So we eventually, we got him out of there, we got him home, um, spoke to the doctor who then added uh, Keppra to the mix. Um, that didn't work very well. We had side effects with that, um, agitation, uh, anger. So again, back to the hospital. We spent another week at, at um, NYU. They weaned him from that medication, added an, another medication. Um, long story short, we've cycled through several meds at this point. He's, he's currently on three, and he still has uh, breakthrough seizures there. Uh, partial complex. Um, he ha has not had a clonic, tonic clonic, well, actually, a year ago, he did have one. He spiked a fever of 103, which is why they believe that happened. Um, and now they come maybe every four to six weeks, we will see a cluster, and then he's fine again until the next one. It's a Frustrating beast, indeed, the the not knowing. Are there any considerations around treating epilepsy for someone who has autism that need to be taken into, uh, into thought? It's a complicated question because um, there are no medications that are specific for autism, except really to treat anxiety, which he certainly has a great deal of. Um, I think that perhaps the two feed on each other, that um, he's already gotten a heightened sensory system um, and more anxiety, and I think the unpredictability of the seizures is very hard on him um, and, and on us. Um, so I think that one sort of kind of scaffolds on each other. Um, and it, it does make it complicated. Sometimes we'll see a be certain kind of behavior pattern before a seizure where he's just He's just a little more, he's a little belligerent, he's cranky, he's irritable, and people will say, oh, that's autism, but but it's not with him. It does really seem to be an indication, but it, it took us years to figure out that correlation. Well, and I, you know, to that point, I, some of the behavioral characteristics or um, communication patterns, intellectual disabilities, you know, as a parent, how do you decipher what symptoms and side effects are a symptom of the autism or a symptom of the epilepsy? Because I imagine that a lot of them look the same, or does it matter? I don't, I think ultimately it doesn't matter because I respond the same way. Again, he's got that heightened sensory system. He had, as a baby, he had a lot of sensory issues. And I think when there's some sort of discomfort in his body and he can't articulate it, um, he'll act on it. I mean, there's a, a very popular saying in the autism community, which is uh, behavior is communication. And sometimes when he can't access the words, it's really up to me to decipher what it is he's trying to tell us with the behavior. That makes sense. So we've talked a lot about 
stigma and epilepsy on this podcast. What are some of the pervasive stigmas that you see around autism? Probably the biggest one is uh, this this idea that people with autism have no empathy, that there's a, a flattening of, of affect. Um, now, there's also another popular saying in the autism community, which is once you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Uh, I like so, that. <laughs> so I, I can only speak for my, my own child, my own life experience. I mean, empathy, I would say, is probably the the biggest misconception out there. Um, and I think there's a lot of fear. People, I think naturally, it's human nature to fear what we don't know, what's unfamiliar. Um, certainly, I saw it after we got the epilepsy diagnosis, where um, suddenly play dates that he would go on, the other parents became nervous. And uh, one in particular wouldn't agree to to a play date unless it was either at my house or if it was at her house, she wanted me to stay in her house. And, and I, I mean, I understand that. Um, my older son has a severe life-threatening food allergy. And I know that when he used to go to friends' houses for play dates, there was a lot of conversation about what to feed him, what to do, where was the EpiPen. So, you know, I, I get it. I do. I, I get that fear aspect. You've mentioned your son a couple times. Having a sibling with a um, who requires a lot of additional attention um, can be difficult. In what ways have you and your husband changed perhaps your parenting styles or been there for your older son to make sure that he was getting what he needed as well and not feeling left out? Yeah, I think that's inevitable whenever one child has special needs. Um, you have to make a very conscious effort to spend as much time and attention and energy as you can on the non-affected sibling. And non-affected is really a misnomer because, of course, he's affected by his, his brother's condition. But the thing about siblings is I think they're kind of like the unsung heroes of autism. They, they, they grow up in waiting rooms far too soon. But on the flip side of that, they, they do learn so much compassion and, and kindness. Um, I think it was really, the hardest time I would say was probably the teenage years, which are hard no matter what. Um, but what we found was our older son didn't want to bring friends home anymore. Um, prior to that, it had never been an issue. And he was, he was really his brother's fiercest champion. Um, but in high school, I think, you know, some embarrassment about being different had crept in. So that was difficult. And it was also difficult when he took high school biology and came home one day and said, well, how do you know that I won't have a child with these conditions? And the truth is, we don't know. Um, what I think I said at the time was something like, um, we spit for science, we give blood, we, give, we enter every possible test every study, every protocol, and um, we support these organizations and hope that by the time you are ready to have children of your own, that maybe we will have better answers, um, maybe genetic answers. Um, and I, I think at the time that, that did seem to comfort him. I'm sure it's still on his mind. Um, he's engaged to be married in a few months. And um, yeah, I of course, it's got to be on his mind. How could it not be? Now, have you done genetic testing for Mickey to see if you can find a genetic diagnosis? We have. We, to date, have found nothing. Um, we've, we've done Simon Simplex, uh, CGI, uh, several studies at NYU. Not, and I'm still happy to keep spinning and keep giving blood. Um, but nothing has turned up yet. They found one chromosomal deletion, um, or one spot on a uh, chromosome. And it turned out my husband had the same deletion, and the doctor said it didn't seem to be a significant part of the genome. They didn't think it was anything. So uh, we're still waiting. <laughs> I know that, that uh, path all too well. Um, you know, you've, you've mentioned uh, in the past about how you actually feel that Mickey as an adult now, that the epilepsy is a slightly more challenging part of his life than the autism in some respects. Can you speak to that? 
we've put in a lot of time now with autism, and I feel like we have a pretty good handle on what works for him and um, how to make him as productive and happy as possible. But the thing about seizures is um, it's like terrorism. It You never know where or when it could strike. Um, we've seen it, you know, at the beach, walking across a parking lot, at a Super Bowl party. Uh, there's just, there's no rhyme or reason that anyone has ever been able to discern the pattern. So um, it, it's hard to live with. It's it's stressful for all of us. Uh, we're hypervigilant. We're, you know, one ear is always caught listening um, to make sure he's okay. If he's, if he's in the shower, someone is standing nearby just just in case. How is Mickey doing today? What does a, a typical day look like for him? Um, he's doing great. The pandemic was, was challenging. Um, he was home for seven months, but I think we were very lucky in that sense because now that he's not in school, we didn't have to deal with any of the hybrid learning issues. Um, but now he attends a wonderful day program um, that we're thrilled with. Um, he goes, as of last week, he's going five days a week. It's called Spectrum Designs. It started in Port Washington, uh, Long Island, New York. Um, ten years ago, it was started by some moms, as so many of these programs are. And uh, the company piece of it, which is Spectrum Designs, designs, um, they do branded merchandise, anything you can put a logo on, um, t-shirts, hats, coats, um, anything. And in addition to that, there's a second um, prong to that. Uh, it's kind of a hand-in-glove situation. They cre also created a social service agency called the Nicholas Center, and really one enables the other. Um, see, the thing is, after the age of 21, you kind of go over the cliff, and there just aren't, it's not like school. There aren't programs for our kids anymore, but the Nicholas Center in addition to providing all of the vocational or the pre-vocational training that he needs to work at Spectrum, um, they provide a whole range of wonderful services. They do, um, I mean, they work on vital work skills. They provide job coaching when he's actually working at Spectrum. They, uh, they do life skills, uh, social skills, uh, peer connections, recreation, um, community partnership. Um, he's out in the community and he comes home happy and engaged and um, so proud of the work that he's doing. I mean, it, it's really, it's meaningful. And he's making new friends. Um, and the people who work there, just they have wonderful dedication and high affect. And um, they're warm. And, and I mean, it's just this wonderful, wonderful experience. And we could not be happier with it. I love that so much. We need more programs like that one out there. Um, you are so well-spoken and you have so much experience um, in both the autism and epilepsy parenting worlds. What advice do you have for parents who are newly diagnosed, who are starting on this journey? What should they be keeping in mind? Oh, gosh, so much. Um, I would say to re remind yourself that it's a marathon, not a sprint. So you need, really need to pace yourself. Self-care is very important. And when I say self-care, I'm not talking about, you know, going to a wonderful spa for a week. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the basics, um, getting enough sleep, eating well, exercising. Um, there was a study done several years ago um, that showed that autism moms had stress levels that were similar to combat soldiers, and they did this by measuring cortisol levels. And uh, I know at the time, I know a lot of aut autism moms who said, I don't know why they bothered studying it, they could have just asked us. Um, but there's a lot of truth to that. Um, so I would say that that would be a, the biggest piece of advice. I would also say, um, you are the expert on your child. Um, not the doctors, not the therapists, not the teachers. They're all wonderful, um, or most of them are. But they go home at night. You don't. You're in this for the long haul. So I think you really need to trust yourself. Trust your gut um, when something feels wrong. Um, find, find your fellow travelers um, because they are the ones who really, truly get it. And they will shore you up and make you laugh. And 
you know, if you need a 2 a.m. run to the emergency room with your kid, those are the people you call. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with any of that more. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today and sharing your years of knowledge and experience. I I do think that this is a conversation topic, the comorbidity between autism and epilepsy that really needs to be discussed more and, and brought into the light. I don't think as many people realize how common and how intertwined the two diagnoses can be. So we just greatly appreciate your your knowledge and, and sharing it with us today. Well, thank you for having me. This was great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Leanne, for sharing your journey and experiences with your son, Mickey, and for your advice to others parenting children with special needs. The comorbid relationship between autism and epilepsy is common, but we still don't understand how and why one third of those diagnosed with autism also develop epilepsy. Understanding this connection may be a key to unlocking some of the mysteries of both autism and epilepsy, but we will only achieve that understanding through research. That is why Cure Epilepsy is committed to funding epilepsy research. We hope that you will help us in our efforts to advance epilepsy research by visiting cureepilepsy.org forward slash donate. Your support and generosity are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.